Welcome to the Pilot's Inner Circle on Flight Training Radio, where a good pilot is always learning. Now, here's your host and certified flight instructor extraordinaire, Jason Shoppert. Hey everybody, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com and welcome to Flight Training Radio, a part of the Pilot's Inner Circle, where literally, just by doing what you're doing right now, listening to this radio show, podcast, whatever you want to call it, uh, you can earn FAA WINGS credits uh, towards uh, renewing your pilot certificate and pushing back that flight review. Also, uh, Pilots Inner Circle members get access to weekly webinars, mock check rides, ton of videos, a lot of really, really uh, great stuff. If you want to check that out more, you can visit pilotsinnercircle.com to consider becoming a member. Uh, in the meantime, this is the free portion of that radio show and podcast. Uh, a little bit later, uh, we'll transition to the paid version of that for the members only, or better yet, called the members only uh, portion of this show. So, uh, first off, greetings from frigid and chilly Central Florida. I think it's a whole 63 degrees today, which warrants having hot tea next to me right now and uh, bundled up in my ski gear. Uh, 63 degrees. That's pretty close to standard temperature, though, if you think about it that way. It's probably a fairly standard uh, atmospheric day. Only a nerdy pilot would think of something like that. But um, anyways, if you guys have a question for me before we get started, uh, questions, I've got a Facebook window open. I've got my Twitter feed open. Also, you can call in live and toll free. That number is 877-537-6704. You will talk to my lovely call screener, and then uh, you and I can chit-chat um, a little bit about your questions. We'll, we'll save questions till the end, but feel free to call in now. Um, or uh, hit me up on Facebook, on the M0A Facebook or the M0A Twitter uh, with your questions. We'll take all those at the end. So what we're talking about today is a, uh, a near and dear subject, and that is the subject of power on and power off stalls. I find time and time again, some students, not everybody, but some students end up having a fear of stalling. Um, that's a play on a fear of falling, by the way. Um, a fear of stalling. Now, now, why is that? And maybe they had a, uh, a bad experience. Um, but for whatever reason, they have a fear of stalling um, that airplane. Okay, and, and before I go too terribly far, let's talk about what is a stall. I don't mean to get down to the very rote basic level of this, but you know what? There may be people out there that don't know, and that's what we're here for. Okay, so a stall in its most basic form, first off, we're talking about an aerodynamic stall. Okay, a lot of times when non-pilots here, they think of a stall, they think of something to do with the engine. The engine quitting has absolutely nothing to do with that. A stall in this context is a aerodynamic stall. It is a loss of lift. You've reached that critical angle of attack and your wing is no longer able to produce lift. Bernoulli's principle has gone out the window in that case, okay? So we're talking about power on and power off stalls, sometimes called a departure or an arrival stall or a takeoff or a landing stall. I mean, there's a lot of different names for it. It's all the same thing. But what I want you to beat into your head today is this. We practice stalls to practice recoveries. We practice stalls to practice recoveries. Nobody cares how you get into the stall. All that matters is how you recover from that stall. Okay, we practice stalls to practice recoveries. I don't want to practice how to stall. I want to practice how to recover. Now, that doesn't mean we're not still going to make the situation realistic. And I'm going to share with you some great ways to help make that more realistic so you are truly practicing a full recovery. But again, it's less important. The focus isn't on how we get into the stall. The focus is on how we recover. Okay. And then later on with the members, I'm going to share some, some different stalls you may have never heard of 
Um, and it's not your fault that you haven't heard of them. You actually would, wouldn't have to hear of them unless you want to become a flight instructor yourself. Those are accelerated stalls, secondary stalls, cross-control stalls, and elevator trim stalls. Uh, but for now, power on, power off is what we're focusing on. And remember that we practice stalls to practice recovery. And by the way, if you guys have a question on stalls, if you have a question, it doesn't have to be on stalls, anything in regards to your flight training, I'm here for you. Again, hit me up on Facebook, hit me up on uh, Twitter, or simply call in. That number again is 877-537-6704. We'll take all those at the end of the show, by the way, towards the end of the show. Um, so we know what a stall is. We know we practice stalls to practice recoveries, and we still want to make it fairly realistic. So another thing you need to understand is a stall can occur at any airspeed. A lot of people think, oh, well, a stall is only going to happen at my uh, VSO speed. I mean, that's, that's just that's what they say in the book. I mean, that's when I'm going to stall. As long as I stay faster than that, I'll be okay. It's not true. You're always going to stall at the same critical angle of attack, which can be reached uh, a few matter of ways. Um, if we get to talk about accelerated stalls, you'll know why. Um, but you can stall at any airspeed. Okay? So don't let that fool you. A lot of times we learn, you know, CG loadings and weight loadings can affect our stall speed. You can stall at a higher or a slower stall speed based on your center of gravity and your weight. And by the way, uh, those of you that are participating in the 31 Day to Safer Pilot Challenge today, well, first off, days eight and nine, uh, tomorrow and the following day are on this topic of power on and power off stalls. That's the whole reason I'm talking about it. Uh, and then day 10 ties that in together, talking about aircraft CG and aircraft center of gravity in regards to your stall recoveries and stall speed. So really cool videos coming up. If you guys are not participating in the 31 Day to Safer Pilot Challenge, I highly, highly suggest it. We are on, we're on day seven today. We got just email about day seven. Um, we've been doing one every day this month of new video, um, and I challenge you guys uh, to go out and watch a video each day. Kind of make it your New Year's resolution to become a safer pilot. That's the whole purpose of the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. A lot of work, a lot of effort went into these videos, so uh, go ahead and check those out. Uh, they're up on saferpilotchallenge.com, saferpilotchallenge.com. Don't look at it yet, um, but uh, at the end of the show, I'll give you that URL again. You guys can go check that out. Um, so enough rambling by me here. Let's get to the nitty gritty. First off, let me uh, grab a drink here. So first thing I want to talk about is a power on stall. In a power on stall, we're simulating what? We're simulating that we're taking off. This is why it's some called departure stall or takeoff stall. I just call it power on stall. Okay, power on stall. Okay, we're simulating we're taking off. So Picture this with me. Obviously, we're at altitude. And when I say altitude, I'm talking 3,000 feet and above. And that's AGL, okay? 3,000 feet and above. We're up there, okay? There is 3,000 feet between us and the ground, AGL, all right? And I want to, first things first, slow my airplane down. Again, we practice stalls to practice recoveries. However, I still want to make this fairly realistic, so it's unrealistic just to yank the nose back and stall the airplane because that's not how you take off. I want you to actually slow the airplane down to rotation speed because if you just yank the airplane back in cruise flight, you're going to end up climbing, which is very unrealistic because if you actually just rotate it and then let's say you rotate at 60 and you don't get any faster than 60, you just keep losing airspeed, you're not going to climb very high. We're going to make this as realistic as possible. Okay, so slow the airplane down. Keep it clean, just like you would for a takeoff. Okay, so we're in our takeoff configuration. I'm slowing the airplane down to my rotation speed, just simply pulling the power back a little bit and, and holding the nose level, almost entering slow flight. I mean, literally, you're entering just about entering slow flight at that point, pitching for airspeed, powering for altitude. And then when I reach that rotation speed, I'm going to smoothly apply full power. There I am. I just simulated that I rotated. So I reach my 60 or whatever my rotation speed is. I smoothly start to apply full power, and I begin to pitch that nose up. And the nose comes up, 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 up. And one thing you're going to realize, and this is just about any airplane, you're going to say, who in their right mind would ever get the nose this high? 
you are going to be sitting so far back in your seat as if you are climbing to the top of a roller coaster with that little chain clicking as it pulls you up, waiting for that big drop. The stall horn and horn is going to be blary. You may be able to legally log rotorcraft helicopter time because you are going to be just hanging from that propeller pitched up. Okay, And that's just some airplanes. Um, you, other airplanes like a Cherokee 140, that Hershey bar wing, they'll, it'll break before you ever get to that point sometimes. But my point of view in telling you that is who in their right mind would ever let the nose get this high? That's my point of even telling you that in the first place. We get that nose back. That stall warning horn is blaring. Those controls begin to get mushy. Again, that we've lost that smooth airflow over the wing. The ailerons are no longer effective. The rudder's still effective, but those ailerons aren't effective. You begin to feel buffeting. That is literally the air spoiling itself over the top of the wing. It is eddying off. It is making you know mini wake turbulence over the top of your wing. That's what's causing that shaking. And then you lose lift and the nose breaks. And we go into our recovery procedure. Well, the recovery procedure is fairly easy. I'm already at full power. I don't need to change anything there. It's just nose down, break that stall, and smoothly bring it back up to the horizon. Don't you dare try to start a climb right after that. I mean, unless it's completely and entirely necessary. But it's nose down and nose level. Build that airspeed back up, then try to climb up in there. And again, when you guys do this stuff, you're going to realize, again, who in their right mind would ever pitch a nose up that high? You'd have to be crazy. And the other thing, you have a stall warning horn or stall warning light, whatever you have, for a reason. In all realistic scenarios, the moment you hear that stall warning horn, it means one thing, discontinue. Whatever you're doing, stop it, because you're going to end up stalling this airplane. The moment you those controls get mushy, stop it. Okay? Now, these examiners, your instructor, they're going to want to see you take some of these to a full break. That's just how it works. However, in all actuality, in real flying, because I know you're a safe pilot, the moment you hear that stall warning horn, you know, it's game over and you're going to be going into recovery before you even get close to a stall. You're at what's called an intermittent stall. You're just about to stall, but you're already recovering. Okay, that stall warning horn was an alarm clock. It just kind of woke you up for a second. Okay, so that's our power on stall. And again, you're going to think, who in the right mind could ever pitch the nose this high? But you'd be surprised. Okay, uh, you know, think about in an IFR situation, it's very easy to get disoriented and end up in that situation. All right, uh, so now let's take, let's, let's flip it around 180 degrees. Let's talk about a power off stall. And before I do that again, any questions? If I'm saying something, if I'm talking too fast, if you want me to go over something again, the MZRA Facebook, the MZRA Twitter, I've got both those open. Or call in, 877-537-6704, anything related to what I'm talking about, or certainly anything flight train related, I'm happy to take that um, at the end here. Um, so power off stall, or an arrival stall, or a landing stall, whatever you want to call the thing, power off stall, we're simulating what? Well, it makes sense. We're the one was simulating takeoff. Now we're simulating we're coming into land. Okay? And you can see, by the way, both of these are, put you in a predicament. Why? Because you're low and you're slow. I mean, you're either taking off your landing in both these scenarios, and both of those happen at very low altitudes. Okay? This is why recoveries are so important to master. So power off stall, I'm simulating I'm coming into land. I like to start this one up like 3,500 feet this time. Okay, I get up to 3,500 feet again, AGL, 3,500 feet between my plane and the ground. Um, so 3,500 feet, and I enter into, again, very similar to slow flight. I'm going to turn the carburetor heat on. I'm going to bring the power back. And I'm going to dump in my flaps all the way to landing configuration. For some of you, that may be 30 degrees. Some of you, that may be 20 degrees. However you normally land the airplane, put that flap setting in. Okay? And then I want you to pitch. I want you to pitch for your approach speed on final. Pitch for that approach. So let's say you approach at 70 on final. You have no problem doing that with the power back and some flaps. And you're going to actually have to nose that airplane over to do that. So pitching for your final approach speed of 70. And this is something kind of unique. Maybe you've done it with your instructor before, though. 
I like to pick an altitude that I say is the ground. So again, I started at 3,500 feet. I'm going to say, okay, the ground is 3,300 feet. So you just, you're descending. You're fully configured for landing. Everything's looking good. You're pitching for 70. You're holding 70. You're passing through 3,400 feet. Then as you approach 3, 000, you know, 25 feet shy of my 3,300, so 3,325 feet, just, just above my mark of what I said is the ground, I'm going to smoothly bring that power back to idle, and I'm just going to crank that nose up like I'm flaring, like I'm a Boeing 777, like I'm the space shuttle coming into land, Okay. I am going to just pitch that thing on back. And you guys all know that I think, I think the word flare is a dirty word. You know, like I said, this space shuttle flares. A Cessna 150 doesn't flare. You're certainly not landing flat, but you're not cranking the thing back yoke all the way in your chest like I'm talking about here. You're going to smoothly bring that back, and you're going to stall um, much more, I don't want to say abruptly, but this is going to have a true break to it because you're slow, and you've got flaps in, and now you've increased that pitch. That stall warn horn is going to come on. Those controls are going to begin to get mushy. And then what's going to happen? That nose is going to fall. If you're coordinated, which you should be, that nose is simply going to fall forward. And then here comes the most important part, which is your recovery. And your recovery, and this is the recovery for the 150. You need to read your POH. You need to consult your instructor uh, for your aircraft. But this is what I do in my Cessna 150. That nose falls forward. It's carb heat, full power, flaps to 20. Okay, I already had the flaps literally at 40. We have 40 degrees of flaps in the 150. So carb heat, full power, flaps to 20. And I'm just maintaining. I'm not trying to climb. I'm just pushing that nose back to level, okay, holding level. Once I exceed 70, in my case, it's miles per hour in the 150. When I exceed 70 miles per hour, flaps go to 10. Once I establish a positive rate of climb or zero, so zero or better, on my VSI, my vertical speed indicator, flaps come up and out. And then I initiate my climb out out of there. That recovery is so important. I can't tell you how many NTSB reports are out there. People trying to recover from a stall. And the first thing they did was take the flaps out. If you've ever taken all the flaps out, on a go-around or anything like that, you know what happens. You sink like a rock. You're going to end up putting a hole in the ground, unfortunately. And again, you guys know I don't like to talk about gloom and doom sort of stuff, but this sort of stuff just has to be said sometimes. It's got to be that order. If you have carb heat, it's carb heat in, full power, and take out that first notch of flaps. Okay? Then from there, once you exceed a certain airspeed, in my case that's 70, Flaps go to 10. And once I've established a positive rate of climb or zero, once I'm out of the negative, flaps up and out, and I'm climbing the heck out of there. Power on and power off stalls, guys, are two maneuvers that need to be in your bag of tricks because you know what? They're going to be on your check ride. They're going to be a focus point on your check ride. And not to uh, you know make it any more difficult, but there is a very good possibility on your check ride that you're going to do turning stalls. And you know what? You may even do those stalls under the hood, under simulated IFR conditions. <laughs> Instrument guys guaranteed to be on your check ride. Private pilot guys, it's considered fair game to do that. And I don't mean to scare you with that. I am challenging you to better yourself and your stall recoveries. Understanding the stall. You know, this may be an episode that you're going to have to go back and listen to the recording again. Write down those steps I outlined. Talk to your instructor. Write down step by step what you can be doing. Okay? Power on and power off stalls. Don't be afraid of turning stalls. Power on and power off turning stalls. Okay? The maximum turn they can give you is 15 degrees of bank to the left or to the right. So it's nothing excessive, but you need to be ready to prepare for that as well. So turning stalls are important to practice. Obviously, again, please don't go out and solo and do all this stuff on your own. Go out and do this with your instructor. Okay? Climb up plenty high to practice this sort of stuff. Okay? Um, and stalls under the hood. Again, VFR, and I'm just being honest with you here, it's a VFR maneuver, but you and I both know there's not a whole lot to see out front other than blue sky or clouds in front of you. 
uh, when you're doing this stuff because you're at such an extreme nose up, uh, you know, condition. Uh, you might as well be under the hood, but you need to practice this sort of stuff under the hood as well. I mean, I want you guys pros at your instrument scans, you know, even as private pilots anyways. Uh, those three hours the FAA requires just isn't enough. All right. Turning stalls, stalls under the hood, some things to focus on. So, guys, um, power on, power off stalls. Work on those recoveries. We practice stalls to practice recoveries, not to practice how to get into a stall. Uh, guys, I'm going to take your questions right after this quick commercial break. Again, on Facebook, ask your questions on Facebook. I see I have a few things sneaking in the Twitter feed. I'll get to those here in a second. Um, also, if you want to call in and talk to me live right now, uh, that number to call in is toll-free. And that number is 877-537-6704. 877-537-6704. Call in. You can talk to me live right now. Um, if you want to talk about stalls, you want to talk about any sort of flight training questions you have, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, call in and we can chit chat 877-537-6704. Um, take a quick commercial break and get right back to you guys um, after the break. Chat with you here in just a second. Are you prepared for an engine failure on takeoff? What if there was runway remaining? What if there isn't? Would you know what to do if you lost radio communications in IFR conditions? My newest book, In Flight Emergencies, a step-by-step -step guide to handling the unexpected, will cover all of this and more. Readers learn about a topic, such as engine failures on takeoff, then at the end of the chapter, there's a URL where they can go and watch a video of an actual engine failure on takeoff and see how the pilot applied the skills mentioned in the book. We're adding videos you love to the books you need because a good pilot is always learning. Check out the book at inflightemergencies.com. Hey there, quick question. What would you do if you lost your logbook? Imagine having to go back in time to track down all of those hours, dates, aircraft flown, and airports landed at. It's near impossible. Trust me, I've done it. Welcome to Runway Log, the best online pilot logbook that lets you log flights on your iPhone, iPad, or Android device. Attach photos to certain entries and see where you've been with our interactive map. Best of all, it's backed up every hour and fully exportable to CSV or PDF. Runway Log has your back. It even sends reminders when your flight review is due. Don't wait another second. Start your free trial of Runway Log today. Visit RunwayLog.com. The Pilots Inner Circle is more than just a ground school. It's a community. And I want to thank you for all that you're doing. You're going to grow this show. You're going to be the most popular and best instructor in the nation because you focus on people and learning. You're sincere. You have integrity. And you have character. And your wife is a great gal, too. Members get a chance to interact with me and others uh, each and every week live in the radio shows like the one you're listening to now or every Monday evening in the mock check rides and weekly workshop webinars that we do. Uh, Jason really does a wonderful job teaching his students all the basics you're going to need to help test, pass your written test as well as uh, your practical tests. Um, <clears throat> once you're a member, uh, they hold the online seminars every week. Uh, this is really a big key uh, as far as my training was concerned because there's those nagging questions, you know, exactly what does this do, what does that do. With a 100% pass rate and over 1,000 check rides passed, what's not to love about the pilot's inner circle? Members also get FAA WINGS credit for listening to this very radio show you're listening to now in addition to the extended version. So what's not to love? Visit pilotsinnercircle.com to become a member today. All righty, guys, back with you here. Uh, a bunch of questions coming in, a few on hold on the line. Let's jump to Twitter first. Actually, I'm going to jump in the order these kind of came in here. Um, first off, first two questions are from two uh, different flight instructors. Good stuff. Uh, Andrew Hartley, 
uh, in Columbus, Ohio. If you're looking for a great flight instructor in Columbus, Ohio, Andrew Hartley is your guy. Um, he said, as a student, he's a CFI now, was practicing power on stalls and scared himself pretty bad. Didn't set it up right. Just pulled back from cruise. And Andrew, as I'm sure as you heard uh, from the beginning, that's something we talked about. And, and I know we practice stalls to practice recoveries, but we want to make this as realistic as possible. And it sure isn't realistic going from cruise flight at 110 knots and just yanking that nose back. At that point, you're just trying to become an aerobatic champion. <laughs> And it doesn't it just doesn't work like that in a one seventy two or whatever you're flying. Um so you're exactly right. Uh the the important thing is to slow the airplane down. Let's make this departure stall uh or takeoff stall, power on stall, whatever you want to call it, as realistic as possible. Let's slow the airplane down to our rotation speed and then apply full power and climb out from there because in reality you're not gonna be rolling down the runway at 120. I don't think your tires are rated for that. So, <laughs> Andrew, great comment. Again, if you guys are in the Columbus, Ohio area, uh, Andrew Hartley is going to be the one to reach out to up there. Um, uh, another question from our buddy Larry, a great flight instructor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. If you need a flight instructor in the Michigan area, Larry is the guy to go to. Um, Larry said, do I cover turning stalls with my students? Um, I do, but have not been asked or had a DPE ask for one. So he's saying he's teaching his students turning stalls, but no DPEs ask for them. Larry, I'll share with you my story is the exact opposite. I very early on in my flight training uh, or my instructing was not teaching turning stalls, believe it or not. Um, young and naive, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't teaching it. And then I had a student um, go up for his check ride, and they did turning stalls. Now, thank God. Um, my student was like some flying prodigy and just just knew how to do it. It was very cool. We'd done a lot of stalls before, and some had broken to the left or the right, so he knew how to handle that situation. And the DPE came back and said, listen, Jason, you know, if you're going to keep sending students to me, um, I'm going to keep asking them this stuff and making them demonstrate turning stalls. And he's had somebody turn stalls under the hood. I mean, we have a real – I mean, it's a good, honest check ride. Uh, and we know what he wants to see, but a, a, a nice guy, um, you know, ultimately. But uh, turn installs, absolutely. Uh, I certainly prep for in my DPE that I use here, and there's a few other in Florida uh, that ask for them. So I would keep teaching those turn installs, um, Larry, definitely. Uh, Gary, uh, reading yours now. Um, uh, Gary says he's always afraid of an accidental spin entry uh, during stall practice. Have any tips to help avoid that? Um, Gary, this is my number one tip, and there, there's a catch to it, though. The thing is to keep the airplane coordinated. Now, here's the catch. When I tell people, hey, let's keep the airplane coordinated, they just want to fixate on that ball, on the turn coordinator, turn slip indicator, whatever you have. They just want to fixate on that, and then something else goes awry, and then they end up turning. Well, you're coordinated, but you're in a bank to the left, and now it's definitely going to break to the left or the right. Gary, it's just going to be a matter of working your way up to it. And this is when students have a fear of stalling, this is what we do. You don't have to do a power on stall at full power right away. Instead, go out and do a power on stall at 1,700 RPMs like you would for a run-up. And then once you master that and feel comfy with that, bump it up to 18, 1,900 RPMs and slowly increase the power. Try doing a turning stall at 1,700 RPMs and slowly build up your confidence. you got to remember, Gary, you are the pilot in command. And when you go up for your check ride, maybe you're already a private pilot, I don't know the whole story, but you have got to have command of that airplane. You've got to be one with it, and you've got to make it do each and every little thing. You have to fly the airplane. You cannot let the airplane fly you. And that's what it comes down to. I don't mean to be preaching to you here, but you've got to slowly start building up your confidence with that. And it starts with doing it at less and less power and working your way up. So, Gary, hope that helps. Keep it coordinated, but don't focus on it because you'll, something else will end up going awry. Um, I don't see anything on Facebook right now. I'll come back to that here in a second. Um, a few on the line here. Again, if you guys want to call in with your questions, anything flight training related, doesn't have to be stalls per se, toll free 877-537-6704. Uh, my friend Rick, sorry for leaving you on hold so long. Rick wants to talk about um, some interesting things going on uh, with his check ride. So, Rick, I hear you've had a few little hiccups along the way. Uh, how the heck are you doing, my friend? Yeah, a few little hiccups. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, listen, before I even talk about that, is, as far as check rides, mm -hmm. um, 
I discovered something that I didn't realize on my first of two check rides, the only mm-hmm. one that I actually did some flying to speak of, is that there's a difference between breaking a stall at the first buffet and a full break. Yes. I, I You know, as a good pilot, I don't think any of us are going to wait for a full break in real life. Mm-hmm. But on the check ride, you know, I, I broke a stall way too soon. He said, well, that's not a full stall. And I'm thinking, you know, obviously you got to do it. you got to do yeah. the full break. But the reality is, in real life, why would you ever have a full break? Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. And you and I have had this conversation before. Prepping for a check ride and prepping for real-world flying is a lot different. And you said it yourself the other day when we chatted. If you remember, if the check ride was, hey, Mr. or Ms. Examiner, let's go fly to this airport and get lunch, you'd pass with flying colors, you know? And that is real-world flying. But sometimes these guys, they've got to see and want to see those full breaks. And that can end up biting you in the butt if you have a fear of stalling in that case. So great point to uh, bring up there. Appreciate it. Yeah, I really wish the check ride would be going to lunch. I'm very good at lunch. Yeah. Um, all right, so, I, I, you know, cut me off whenever you want because I can talk about these two check No, go for it, man. At nauseam. Um, I, I, did, I passed my oral, uh, no problem, and that it, it was relatively painless and relatively easy. I only had a couple different notes, and he was very helpful during the oral. And we scheduled the check ride about a week or so later. I did not realize at the time that I had a physical issue that was causing me to not be able to sleep well and a whole bunch of other issues. And so I violated one of the acronyms that I know, Jason, you are just absolutely harping on, and that's that I'm safe acronym. Mm -hmm. Because I think you got to add a D to it. I'm safe D. And the D is don't be stupid and do a check right if not 100% healthy. (laughs) No, you're right. You're right. So, so, um, I, honestly, I, I, I couldn't even keep my eyes open during the check ride, and I think the only thing I didn't do or that I did properly is that I didn't crash the plane. Wow. So that discouraged me, and I, I waited almost six weeks until I tried to do a check ride two days ago. Mm-hmm. Same examiner, um, and there's a personality issue between the two of us. Not that I d- dislike him and, and he dislikes me. Is I'm very outgoing. Mm-hmm. I will talk forever, and I talk in the plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this guy's as stiff as a board. Yeah. When we got out to the plane, the plane that I normally or that I wanted to fly was not available, and I knew it because we had to reschedule. So I get a, a 172. It's the same model, but they all fly differently. And so I'm going to do a check ride in a plane that I've never flown. Wow. So maybe it's an I'm safe D N N. Never do a check ride unless you're familiar with the plane. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So you know we had some problems like the fuel gauges wouldn't, wouldn't work, but we were filled full to the brim and fuel, and when I said, you know, why don't we just do it anyway? It's like, oh, my God, you wow. that's in violation of the minimum equipment. And you can't do that. All right, so that's a problem. We got them to work. Yeah. Um, but my first landing he wasn't happy about, and I wasn't used to this plane. It was low in power. Mm-hmm. But the, the the one thing that ended the check ride almost immediately, and this is I'm only relaying this that if you're not 100% happy with with the examiner or the check ride, there's always tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm flying out of Van Nuys, nice airport, very very busy. It is the first day after three days of wind and rain, and even today, two days later, it's very windy. But it's yep. a perfect day, so everybody's in the air. And on my second takeoff and landing, I'm downwind. And I did a short field takeoff. I knew it was going to be a short field landing. And the tower calls and says that I'm number four for landing and extend downwind. Wow, on a short field landing of all things. On a short field. So I finally turned turned to base probably a half a mile farther out than I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, Turned final, and I'm pitched okay. Uh, I'm doing what amounts to slow flight into the runway. Yeah. And then I hit it, no question, within 200 feet of the mark. No question, except I was off a little bit to the right. Mm. And he basically said, do you want to keep flying, or should we just end it now because you didn't pass? Wow. And my reaction was um, two things. The, verbally, I said um, to him, now, I tell you what, let's end it now because I'm never going to be able to go up before I have to do the oral again because you have only 60 days. Yeah. And as long as i got to do the oral again, your plane, just go ahead and taxi back. And that Whoa. was I, I said, your plane, I left his controls, I'm done with this guy. And what I didn't say to him is in the back of my mind, I already had a plan B, mm-hmm. and that's to visit my friend Jason and finish up with you. <laughs> <laughs> that might just be the best idea. I mean, but and Rick, but think about 
you know, everything that's just been stacked against you, you know, from this point, from being sleep deprived to you and I have discussed, maybe you've got a little bit of test anxiety on top of it. And I can't think of any worse monkey wrench to throw into it than, by the way, the airplane you have your last hundred hours in, yeah, it's down for maintenance. You're going to be flying this airplane that you've never flown before. Good luck on your check ride. <laughs> you know, you know well, uh, no, it's crazy. I had a, I had, because I only had a week left before mm-hmm. my oral expired, I had no right. choice. Yeah. Either try it or, or, you know, either do it or don't do it. Yeah. Um, I know I can fly an airplane. Mm-hmm. Test anxiety, I certainly have. Um, but I know I can fly. Hell, I'm flying in the Los Angeles basin. <laughs> you only, you have to only, to fly an airplane. Right. The only thing I'm not comfortable with is flying through Bravo airspace because I haven't done much of it. But if I had to, yeah. you bet. I can get flight following. I know the different routes, and I could I could fly them Yeah. if yeah. I had to. Absolutely. Um, fortunately, I don't have to until you and I fly through Bravo out in Florida in a few months. There you go, man. I'm telling so you, I, I, I'm ready for it. We need to do it because it sounds like you've got dealt a few bad cards over there, and we need to get you excited about flying again. Is what it sounds like. And 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 I gotta get I gotta get in, into the airplane that somebody was stupid enough to fly cross country. You know, <laughs> one fifty because that, that's all crazy. all the way out to you and back, man. Too bad they didn't know you back then. We could have crashed <laughs> at your house. So <laughs> there you go. Anyway, so the reason I wanted to just mention all this stuff is that um, if anybody can get discouraged, it should be me. Mm-hmm. And just because there's a problem does not always mean it's a your fault mm-hmm. or your abilities. Just things happen. Yeah. No, well, you're yeah. you're exactly right. Anyway, I'm done. Cool, cool. Well, Rick, um, sorry, sorry for your uh, unfortunate situation and everything else as far as that goes. But uh, I mean, good for you, man, for simply uh, you know keeping your head up and just uh, pushing through it. Um, Sounds like a lot's been stacked against you. I'm just excited to hear that you're uh, you're not throwing the towel as far as that goes. So that's awesome, man. After after almost fifteen thousand dollars, you bet I'm gonna finish this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, cool, Rick. Well, Rick, I'm gonna let you go, and we're gonna wrap up the show here. And I really, really appreciate you calling in, my friend. Okay. All right. Thanks, my friend. Thanks, man. I'll see you. Bye. Cool. Very, very cool. And you know what? I'll tell you, it takes a lot of guts to uh, to call in and chit chat about something like that. Really. Uh, unfortunate story, but this is how we learn, guys. You know, I mean, when something's not right, you ultimately, um, like I was just telling uh, Gary, you know, you are the pilot in command, and you've got to make those decisions. And maybe, you know, I know you're trying to push to get a check ride done, but a lot of times, I mean, think back to like the, the JFK accident. And I know I've used this example a lot, but um, just picture that. He was an important figure, an important figure at a wedding. He had to get to that wedding. It was low IFR conditions. It was nighttime. He was flying a high-performance airplane. He didn't have a whole lot of time. And by the way, I mentioned he wasn't instrument rated, flying over the ocean. Okay? When you have that anxiety to want to get somewhere, want to get something done, sometimes it can end up biting you in the butt. And I'm not saying, you know, that's a very extreme example. What I'm ultimately saying is when these odds are stacked against you, when it's, hey, you're doing your check ride, maybe another airplane, maybe it's time to say, listen, I'm not comfortable with that. Could I do it? Yeah, maybe. But I'd really like to fly the airplane I've been flying for the past 100 hours or whatever it is. So um, that's that. Really, really, Rick, uh, appreciate calling in on that. Uh, I'm going to make a quick refresh here, make sure there's no questions. Guys, we're really wrapping this up. 877-537-6704 if you have any questions. And we're going to have to make them uh, quick here. If not, you guys know how to get in touch with me. Check in Facebook. Nothing on Facebook that I can see. Uh, check in Twitter. I think we cleared out Twitter. Uh, looks like we've cleared out the phone line. So, um, guys, that is that. Um, awesome, awesome questions. We're going to move on now in just a second to the members only portion when I sign off with you guys. Um, and we're going to chat about accelerated stalls, secondary stalls, cross control stalls, and elevator trim stalls. Um, some stuff you may have never even heard of. Why? Well, because you don't learn about it until you actually become a CFI, which blows my mind. Um, you know, you never have to demonstrate this sort of stuff unless you want to become a flight instructor. Um, same thing with spins. Really, really bugs me. And I'll, and I'll share that more with my members and stuff like that. So, um, guys, that is basically it. Uh, members, remember we have a webinar tonight. Um, I know there's a big football game at the same time. Uh, so <laughs> whoever you're rooting for, I'll, I'll keep it quick um, as far as that goes. So, um, anyways, guys, that's all I have for you today. We're going to move on to the members-only portion, non-members. 
uh, consider becoming a member. Go ahead and check out pilotsinnercircle.com. Very, very low uh, monthly fee. Gets you access to the members-only portion, which goes on much longer beyond this, uh, to listen to, to earn those FAA WINGS credits. Um, you get access to the webinars, like I was just mentioning to you, mock check rides. Uh, if you upgrade that membership, access to the videos, a ton of really, really uh, good stuff as far as that goes. So um, pilotsinnercircle.com. Check that out. Consider becoming a member today. Also, I hope you're participating in the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. It is saferpilotchallenge.com to go ahead and take action on that. Be sure to leave me a comment, share that on Facebook and Twitter with your friends as well. So guys, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for being such a huge blessing to myself, my beautiful wife, and this wonderful business. You guys really are the reason we get up and do what we do each and every day, up early before the sun comes up, and uh, in bed uh, fairly late most nights. Uh, it's uh, you guys are the reason we do what we do. So anything I can do for you guys, again, please don't hesitate to reach out. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. See ya.